Good evening. Welcome to the Welcome Collection. Tonight's talk is called Fate of the Nation. I'm with Neve Thompson, and we are here live in the forum in the Welcome Collection on Euston Road. Uh, just before we get going, just to give you an idea of the format this evening, we'll be having a talk from Neve. We'll be opening it up to a little bit of, of conversation afterwards. Um, and then we're going to end uh, our live stream after that. Uh, a word of warning, we have got um, uh, some footage here that will be uh, broadcast throughout the talk. And there are images um, of what's called blackface uh, due to the representation of mummers and Morris men as part of the folkloric tradition. And we don't wish to cause any offence, but I just wanted to flag that up uh, first. And there are images of, of hooded figures as well. But the purpose of this talk is to be quite critical and to look with a critical eye at these uh, older practices that are now no longer um, relevant uh, and have been rightfully left behind. So uh, just to warn you uh, in advance. So uh, we, without further ado, then I think that's all I need to cover. Uh, my name is Danny. I'm a white uh, man, uh, now in his 50s, with a grey beard, and I'm wearing a blue uh, patterned shirt and a blue tie. And I'm going to hand over now to Neve to describe herself and take it away. Hi, I'm Neve. I'm a white female, age 24, uh, wearing a white t-shirt and jeans. Um, yeah, so I guess my introduction would be looking at archives, which is how I met Danny here and how I kind of got involved with the Welcome Collection. So it began as part of my master's project, um, specifically a module focusing on archives. But we were really approaching kind of the non-traditional format of an archive. And immediately for me, that led me to the concept of a living archive. And I engaged with the film, not the book, unfortunately, of Fahrenheit 451. And I was thinking about this idea of people becoming books and books becoming people. And then most importantly, communities built on archival practice. And that's kind of where I began. This is what started my process. And then engaging with larger archives, I went straight to the BFI archive, which is a film archive um, with this footage here, if it's able to play. Um, so this is a compilation of BFI archive footage specifically surrounding village fates. So by village fate, I mean those small little fairs, celebrations that take place in each of the small towns or villages of England. Um, they happen in Wales, they happen in Scotland, they happen all over the world, but I spe specifically focused on England. Um, there was kind of this necessity to narrow down quite quickly um, because of kind of the, the amount of material, but also the amount in which there are these divides between place, which is something we'll probably go on to discuss a bit. So I was looking at village fates, so I began by reaching out to 152 villagers from around England and asking them to send me their village newsletter. So these small publications that exist um, are kind of pushed out into the world every month, but only within these small communities, never leaving those villages, never really straying beyond those. And there's an element of them being quite disposable because they only exist for that month. But they record things like celebrations, they record birthdays, they record advertisements, and they're really these microcosm of information. And that, again, led me back to the village fate and this living archive. So if we think about these celebrations, which are centered in kind of an annual repetition or things that recur, maybe not annually, but regularly within a specific community, they're a microcosm archive that filters ideas into set rituals, set actions, and set ideas. So you'll get things like, um, the straw bear in Whittlesey, which every year it celebrates the transition into autumn. They take harvest materials, they take straw, they dress people up in these massive costumes and they run down the streets. And obviously, originally this began as kind of an agricultural rite, but as Britain starts to move away from its need for agriculture, the fate starts to transition as well. So in the transitions, there's repetition, and in the repetition, there's transitions. <laughs> um. That idea about, um, I suppose, what look from the outside looks eccentric, maybe, or unusual, is kind of rooted in lo local practices, I guess. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think one of the starting points was dismantling that kind of overriding idea of the village fate as being this quaint, quaint entity, as being something very idyllic. Um, something that's kind of, the narrative surrounding it is actually coming from an urban landscape rather than from the rural people themselves. And there's this idea that there's a kind of a quaintness which is almost diminishes this much larger, much deeper, much darker meaning behind it. Yeah, some of these um, things are almost, I would uh, say, but like pre-Christian, really, aren't they? They kind of reflect um, a time when we're very reliant on the nature and kind of really dependent on good harvests for other food. Um, so it's it's almost like you're living at the whim of nature, and and uh, whatever you believe kind of controls that or oversees it so it's a it's a vital part of survival really isn't it yeah massively and i think what you said about the church so you have all these rituals that did exist prior to the church but then the church of course adopts them so kind of any large system of power or collective belief will adopt these symbols and transition their meaning so actually what remains stationary is the symbol itself but the meaning is that fluctuating entity but then of course you get things like when the church starts to decline you have these massive symbols with a lot of power and force behind them left without a meaning. Um, so for instance, there's well dressing where you kind of decorate with petals and form these images. And that was for a very, very long time, religious images. But then actually it started to transition and there's one particular one where they made Diana's face, Princess Diana, and it's awful, absolutely horrific. Like it's just the worst depiction of her imaginable, this horrible teethy grin. Um, but it shows how those things start to switch and slide. I'm um, thinking that reminds me of the of Lewis, uh, the practice of the kind of effigy burning, yeah. which I think has, has, has certainly made the news. But it's like it's it's almost this time where um, with these festivals where you kind of get that concept of, um, you know, king for a day, make the village fool the, the ruler. It's a t it's a kind of a time of allowable anarchy. It's like a release, pr letting off of steam and kind of allowing those normal structures to be you know, played around with a little just to kind of uh, keep everybody uh, happy. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. And I think we've spoken about this before and it's the idea of what costumes allow for specifically because people can dress up as these ideas that they wouldn't otherwise express. Um, so I read something that said that England in general really struggles with the idea of death. It's something that we really can't speak about, more so than other countries perhaps. So massively within the faith, particularly historically, dresses up as like... Um, the Grim Reaper, or being dressed in skulls or emblems of death, something that's incredibly popular. But then also, again, the danger with costume is that it's quite easy for it to become very intimidating, um, mm. which is what we've shown in some of the footage here. So one of the first videos I came across was based in a small town in Wales called Aberystwyth, and it's on the coast. And I was watching this thing, and it's a college rag day, and they were walking through the streets, and it's this what seemed like a lovely procession, but then what you start to see is icons of blackface, but you also start to see the distinguished kind of white clo like hooded cloaks that are recognisable now as the KKK in this small town in Wales. So this was, I think, in 1923. And actually what it was coming out of was um, The Birth of the Nation and the release of that film, which in turn was inspired by Walter Scott. So there's these layers here, and the KKK go on to pick up that uniform, but also there's a brief moment in which there's this overlap between fake costumes and what was happening in America. So it's about how these symbols not necessarily were intended to be this horrible, intimidating thing, but actually when they have that element of intimidation purely aesthetically, are so easily picked up and become very dangerous. Mm. And I think it's, it's quite interesting how things that, in a way, could be comic can also become equally sinister i suppose it just depends on the context and how they're presented we were talking um before it's about animals yeah and how you know there's a lot of cute and and uh, fluffy um you know videos around uh, heaven knows my daughter loves the the little hedgehogs that you know <laughs> look very cute when you tickle their tummies but if you were to put someone in a kind of you know a large um like a, a hare's head or something and then, uh, then, then there's no expression there, and they're maybe just walking silently. It could look 
you know, much more sinister. And I have to mention the, the Wicker Man. I don't know if anyone's seen uh, movies, the original movie by uh, called The Wicker Man, which is very much about this kind of ritual practice of, um, in, the, in that case, I don't spoiler alert, um, they do make a sacrifice at the end. But um, yes, it's it's kind of playing around with these these roles. I think in that you see um, Christopher Lee wearing, to all intents and purposes, drag, sort of gender swapping through through clothes. So it's at times, I say, to kind of um, upset the balance a little bit, <coughs> maybe. And it's also about who starts to adopt those costumes. So, for instance, with May Day, you had all these kind of floral dresses. And then May Day overtook in this the really transitional period, and it became Labor Day. But within that kind of space, you get a lot of kind of drag emerging, um, kind of caricatures of the May Queen before it becomes back as this kind of new trend, which we're starting to see now. But actually, in that transition from May Day to Labor Day, we see the kind of the working class start to adopt it, rather than being an association with land, becoming an escape from their work, which was now something that was much more industrial. But then actually when we hit the general strike in 1926, what we see is the middle classes adopting the same rituals, but they're firing it back at the working class. So they started to use the tool of the fate and similar kind of organizations, similar structures, similar games, and they use this structure to then start doing the jobs of the working class. So it becomes a whole system by which people start to fire it against each other and it becomes a class thing too. Mm. That's so interesting you're talking about class because uh, uh, again, I'm sorry if you don't know these references because I'm quite old, but um, there was a sitcom called Jam and Jerusalem, and it was very much um, uh, about that kind of uh, ultra-conservative um, mini-society that's got its very strict rules. Um, you know, lots of arguments about what constitutes a cake, you know, and they want savoury <laughs> on, the, on the cake stand and all that sort of thing. So it c starts to get a bit comic. Um, but originally... Fates were an incredible, um, important event for the poor and, and a gathering that allowed them to access, you know, goods and stalls. And I believe, um, did you have you come across the pie powder court? No, I don't think so. So there was actually when when because ap apparently the difference between a fate and a wake is a fate that was officially sanctioned. So it actually had a royal charter. So that's how important these were considered and they would go on literally for days and some of them got on for <laughs> weeks everyone really wanted to let their hair down the poor and the working class and those that you know um, struggled um, so if you had an official uh, fate um, you were protected and, and allowed to kind of do this officially yeah, cause I, th I might be wrong but I think there was actually a time in medieval England where it was banned to have a fate and it was banned to celebrate in these manners because it was considered this kind of a holy thing um, and so it was written about from people who would travel to the UK from abroad and think it was in English festivals and such a very small green book I found and they commented on England losing its merriness so actually they had pictured England as being this quite merry nation of people willing to put on these costumes and put on these events but actually England lost this and then it described our decline into becoming a very self-conscious nation mm. Interesting. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I did pick up that obviously these originally were, um, at fates were kind of displays and areas where you could purchase cattle, um, livestock, you know, actually trade. And, and, and f uh, people would come from the continent to come and actually buy wholesale to sort of uh, take things back. So it's, it's, yes, it's very local, but actually its impact is, 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 is wider. Isn't yeah, which I think is interesting in the transition now as we start to see kind of the same romanticization of the fate um, within a kind of a younger generation and how that's now connected to work in the sense that we're online and we fluctuate between this digital environment and this physical environment and how the fate's emerging within the digital and how it's using to support, to support commerce, support trends, support kind of fast fashion um, with its iconography. You mentioned fashion and mm -hmm. I know we, we were talking before about the kind of trends i suppose in fashion and um you mentioned this word fairy core which i really liked and ever since you sort of mentioned it and i was looking around so if anyone's seen the you know displays in shops like paper chase uh, recently you'll see this kind of there's a kind of 
lots of folk imagery, lots of imagery about rabbits, um, natural world. Um, you can see how it's kind of become trendy uh, in a way. Um, and I've noticed in advertising sort of these, uh, these sort of wings added onto models made out of feathers or natural products or whatever. And there does seem to be this ki it's quite sort of trendy to sort of be in touch with those kind of slightly unusual um, fashions. Yeah, and I think, I mean, there's loads of words, but you've got cottage core, fairy law, uh, photocopy law coming into it too. And it's all about this merger between that romanticized ideal of something that doesn't really exist, and we all kind of know it doesn't exist, and a kind of an idea of what we'd all like to see. And it's interesting that it imitates that same kind of return to a rural Britain or that longing for it that we saw following the Great Depression. So I'd like to draw parallels between kind of that post-World War II, post-industrialization period, and what maybe COVID has caused, or what maybe kind of our economic decline is starting to cause, and why we're starting to long for those same things again. Except this time it's only on the phone screen, this time it's young women, maybe even idealizing this kind of sexist trope of what a woman used to be. Yeah, yeah, because I suppose a lot of it is tied in with, uh, uh, it's become tied in with, domestic crafts, jam making, baking. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's, it's gone a certain direction. But I know in your book, um, Neve, you, you've kind of mentioned rituals. Mm. And I think, could you tell us a bit about, I think there was a beheading ritual? Yeah, How that's that? a, a, a Morris dance where the actions within the Morris dance involve a beheading. Um, so that's, again, engaging with that premise of death and the idea of how we start to represent that or how we start to talk about that within culture. Um, but within itself is an incredibly sinister and unpleasant thing to watch, um, which is kind of a recurring pattern within these things. But then again, we come back to that language, which comes primarily from kind of an urban landscape. Um, even things like the V&A's village fate, which they've started to reenact the village fate, is very much kind of a quintessential idea of what we think England is, rather than being those kind of horrors which give it that larger meaning. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's I mean, I, I, I live, I work in London, but I live and I've sort of grown up in Kent um, where I still don't know half of the village names. I don't know if you're from one of those, uh, those counties where you just find weird titles like Up Down. <laughs> that's, that's a village, I never heard of that before. And you discover all these tiny little places and then you discover, you know, when you, when you move somewhere, you get things like that. We've recently coming up with the the Scarecrow Festival will be one of our highlights um, on the on the local rural calendar. And you realise that there's lots of sort of practices and things that go on that you just don't get in towns. You don't get in city environments because I suppose you're that bit divorced from um, these kind of uh, traditions and local produce and that sort of uh, thing. Yeah, although there are elements of it starting to rise within cities, so things like um, Lambeth County Fair, which has its popular vegetable competition, but it takes a traditional vegetable competition, adds a whole layer of satire. So you get things like courgettes being sculpted into Margaret Thatcher and <laughs> these little <laughs> scenes of what's happening in Westminster. And I imagine next year we'll probably have Liz Trust carved into a pumpkin. So <laughs> I look forward to that. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yes, you've when you did the the project, you actually you kind of chose um, sort of film stock to sort of base it on. And can you tell us a bit about how you you, you kind of produced an uh, an, an item a publication? Mm. Yeah. So from going from those 152 villages that I contacted, having their newsletters, the initial process there was compiling that content with anything else they sent me and just overprinting it and seeing what started to generate. Um, and then I laid that out on a table and asked people to make badges from it. So I was thinking about the idea of taking from an archive and starting to give it life again, giving something that people can take home, which was in turn inspired by Morris dancers and the fact that they wear these badges as kind of symbols of where they've danced, where they've been, and that in turn becomes a living archive or a living costume of archive. So I was looking at that. And then my kind of a rule that I set myself is that everything had to come from amateur film or it had to come from something specifically from that village that was being stored within that village, um, which was an interesting parameter because a lot of the footage was unusable or very poor quality. I had to add some half tones into that to make it just be able to fit within a publication. But what it did give is a really interesting insight 
and some of the screen grabs that you could get from that and some of the stills looked like they were professionally photographed or staged because of these events being so bizarre. And then when I was working with that, it started to compile its own narrative because it was so visual and so obscure. So you could see relationships between things. Um, there was a great moment where I was watching one video of, of the general strike and there was these policemen stood outside of a coal mine. And then this fantastic, it cut to this um, pantomime they were having in this one village with all the women dressed as police officers taking the mickey out of what was happening next door. So all these things that you can start to place in parallel on the page and it constructs its own narrative through how this fate is kind of evolving, how it's adopting, how it's changing with the time. Um, and then within that, obviously there's this overriding cyclical nature within the framework of a year. So beginning with that first spring, I was looking at the post-industrial and how we had that return to, yeah, a return to a rural Britain, but it had its struggles. It still kind of had its slight links to agriculture. There were all these layers here. And then looking at summer, looking a lot at the kind of sports and how that forms like small regional divides, but how regional divides, when they become picked up, become quite national divides, which can force it into kind of dangerous territory. Um, and then in autumn, I was looking at how the symbols start to become lost. So you get things that had an original meaning, but it becomes obscured. You get things like the Abbots Ripley horn dance, where these people put on this kind of Morris dance, these massive antlers. Um, but there's this fantastic interview of them speaking to this young guy who does it now. And they say, why did you do it? And why, why are you doing this? And he's like, well, because my dad did it. And they ask, well, why did your dad do it? And he says, well, his dad did it. And then it keeps going in this continuous interview where they just don't stop. But it's this idea that then tradition takes over beyond that original meaning, but it's not important because it's still got meaning. And then in winter, I was really looking at when things start to become a little bit dangerous. So I was thinking, why were the KKK forming? Why was this happening? Why was this symbol being adopted by this group of people? And then that second spring, mirroring the first spring, was looking at that post-digital rather than the post-industrial, and landing on why would we need a fate again if we don't have this dependence on agriculture, if we don't need this kind of economic element, why would we need it now? And I guess the, the overriding reason for having a dependence on land again would be an environmental one. So it's kind of a maypole with environmentalism right at the heart, and then you see how climate activists have adopte adopted the fate as kind of tools of action. Mm. That's a, that's a, it does re it must make it re you realise that it's these things don't go away and they become more relevant perhaps, but there's resurgences because maybe people and I don't know how uh, the audience feel about lockdown. Suddenly you couldn't go anywhere. And you had to maybe wander, as I did, my local area, discover nooks and crannies that I'd never done before, and maybe appreciate perhaps what was on your doorstep a bit more. Yeah, well, that's the other side of it, is that <coughs> it's by no means a commentary saying that every symbol that exists is somehow this sinister thing with this massive meaning behind it. I mean, I think there's elements of you're, you're selling a like, piece of cake, you're selling a piece of cake. But there's this side of things that, things can become adopted or they might be but then there's also this fundamental underlying thing of that a community needs things like this to start to come together and start to form and particularly I think at times of isolationism such as World War II which was the biggest kind of spur of the fate and times like Covid you realise why these things are also just important on a very like wholesome level. Bringing actually there can be very positive bringing together as of communities. Yeah. Um, and I think these days, I've, uh, you know, you get more celebration of other communities, non, you know, um, non-English communities, and everybody gets together. And there's Mellors or Diwali or lots of lots of celebration of, of everybody celebrating their own um, traditions and heritage um, in, in a sort of positive way. Um, I would like to sort of mention a couple of things, if that's all right. Um, just to show that, that it is relevant. Um, I'm not quite sure if this is a good example, but prog, uh, progressive rock, uh, if you will. <laughs> um, this uh, latest edition featuring Kate Bush, she's still alive, thank goodness. Um, and one of my favourite artists uh, called Gweno. Uh, she's an independent uh, sort of singer who has done albums in Welsh and has just done her first album in Cornish. And I love this picture because I was thinking, well, there you go. There's, there's sort of folk core 
uh, if you like, uh, making a resurgence. So she's obviously gone for a traditional uh, folk costume there uh, to do with Cornwall and, and the Cornish language, which you know nearly died out. And it's nice to see these things um, come back and people take a sort of, I guess, a kind of, uh, a sort of pride in it, in, in a good way, without denigrating anyone else. I think that's, mm -hmm. the, that's the key thing, isn't it? Um, yes, um, when you were talking about sort of divisions, I was thinking about the Scon and the, the Devon Cornwall, mm -hmm. uh, you know, debate about whether it's cream or jam on first, but we won't go there. <laughs> we won't do that. <laughs> Dangerous territory. <laughs> um, I can't let you go without talking. Uh, I'd like to mention. So you you were talking about um, the sort of the way it's evolved and changed, and I can't <coughs> help thinking of that wonderful film Hot Fuzz, which I don't know if you've seen the the comedy. But that really, when you were talking about the kind of yeah ultra conservative kind of sinister element that that this is our community, these are our rules, you know, mm -hmm. and I, I do think of the League of Gentlemen as well, the local yeah. shop for local people. You know, it's not for outsiders, you know, ooh, someone's coming. And there's that kind of, there can be that sort of suspicion uh, when you're in a community that really knows everybody else. Um, but uh, I thought Hot Fuzz, great example of people getting a little bit overzealous about yeah. rules. <laughs> yeah, and there's also, uh, I have a friend who is American and showed me this small little book and it's how to not get murdered in an in in English village. And it's looking at all these things like be careful of the person selling jam, be careful of the person in the church, basically listing off everyone in the village <laughs> and say be really careful. <laughs> um, so that was a good one. But also I, I should probably mention as well is the film Arcadia as well, which takes a lot of BFI footage of rural England and then starts to dismantle it um, with a really good soundtrack, um, but with a kind of a non-prescriptive narrative. So starting to put in a lot of the imagery that you'll find on the BFI. Um, which is a really interesting take on kind of rural England in a broader form. Brilliant. Well, <laughs> um, I would like to, I suppose, first of all, thank you for uh, coming along. We, um, we met uh, when the Royal College of Art came and did a project about archiving. And I just thought uh, when I came across these, these wonderful badges that were being made out of the, the village, um, pamphlets, the sort of parish uh, fake pamphlets, I thought, what an original uh, take on things. Um, and I used to, I'll confess, I used to live in a village in Kent that had um, the World Custard Pie Throwing Championship. <laughs> Try and put itself on the map. Uh, but it worked. So we used to go and, you know, you could, you could pay some money to get some balls and throw things at crockery, which my kids loved. They could smash things and that was okay. Um, but uh, a, a film crew actually came from Japan to film <laughs> the custard <laughs> pie throwing. And do you know what? They actually won. <laughs> they were very good. There were rules about custard pie throwing. So I've kind of seen the, you know, the fun uh, and frivolity at mm -hmm. first hand. And it, does, it certainly does you know, bring people together. Um, and uh, yes, well, I hope this has, this has shed a light, a new light on uh, the village fate. So um, perhaps you could join me in just thanking uh, Neve for the talk this evening. Thank you. <laughs> so thank you very much for joining us um, on YouTube. And uh, we're going to draw it to a close there. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I should say that after we have finished today, we will put uh, later on a BSL interpreted version of this event to watch. So thank you and good night. <laughs>